60 News at 10. I'm Brendan LePaul. Making the headlines tonight. Datu Sri Isma Sabri remains as Prime Minister candidate. And enough funds to fulfill 2023 budget promises. Datu Sri Isma Sabriyakob remains as Barisan Nasional's BN poster boy and candidate for the post of Prime Minister in the 15th general election, GE15. BN Chairman Datu Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid Hamidi, who said this, added that the coalition stand on this would not change if BN succeeded in getting to administer from Putrajaya. Datu Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid, who is also AMNO president, said, Following BN's stand, the question of whether Datu Sri Isma Sabri would be BN's candidate for the post of the Prime Minister did not arise, but this was being played up by the opposition. At the party level, he said, The decision that Datu Sri Isma Sabri is a candidate for the post of Prime Minister is final, as decided by the AMNO Supreme Council. Speaking today, he said, The actions of certain parties are only aimed at causing friction, especially within AMNO, and among the BN components, as they have no other means. Previously, there had been statements from certain quarters claiming that the incumbent, Datu Sri Dr. Hamad Zahid, for the Bagan Datu parliamentary seat would be named as candidate for the Prime Minister post if BN wins in GE15. Acts of sabotage must be stopped to ensure the victory of Barisan Nasional BN in the 15 general election G15 to form a stable government, stressed Prime Minister Datu Sri Isma Sabri Yaakob. The Yamno Vice President said that party members should put the interests of the party as a priority because whoever is chosen as a candidate in the election carries the party's flag. They are not contesting on individual capacity. Their victory is for BN. Saya ucap terima kasih kepada ramai yang bekerja kuat untuk kemenangan parti. Untuk diri sendiri, berangan-angan sikit-sikit tu okeylah. Tak ada masalah. Tetapi jangan kerana kita nak bertanding dan tak dapat bertanding, kita sabotaj kawan yang bertanding. Itu yang tak boleh. Bergerak kulu kilir untuk pastikan calon kita kalah. Datu Sri Isma Sabri said this when officiating the Borough AMNO Division Delegates meeting at the Borough District Council Convention Hall today. The Prime Minister also emphasised that the result of GE14, which saw BN fail to form a government at the federal level, should serve as a lesson to strengthen the coalition, to avoid political instability, resulting in a change of national leadership several times since 2018. He added that work should start as early as possible following his announcement on the dissolution of Parliament on 10 October after obtaining the consent of the young Dipatuan Agong. On a separate note, the Prime Minister said the government has money to implement the budget 2023, tabled on 7 October, which is the largest budget ever prepared involving an allocation of 372.3 billion ringgit. Budget, apabila kita umumkan di dalam parlimen, Kita telah pun mempunyai duit untuk melaksanakan setiap yang kita janjikan. Beza dia. Kita dah ada duit. Cuma belum lulus lagi. Itu beza dia. Jadi boleh kabur ke orang-orang kat luar sana? Kalau nak bajet yang cantik seperti itu dilaksanakan, undilah kita. Baru kita boleh bentangkan semula dan luluskan bajet. Today, several media reported that the Gerakan Tanah Ae GTA sponsor, Chairman Tun Dr. Mate Mohammed, questioned the government's ability to implement the essence of Budget 2023 because he claimed, among other things, that the government lacked funds and lacked efficiency to implement those projects. Dr. Sri Isma Sabri also stressed that the budget, which was formulated by covering all levels of society, aimed to benefit the grassroots and not just tycoons, as claimed by some parties. 
The government always pays special attention to the Indian community in various aspects, including in terms of education and the economy. The Prime Minister said that, for example, Budget 2023, which was tabled in Parliament on 7 October, also covered various initiatives specifically for the Indian community, such as the 100 million ringgit for Indian entrepreneurship development under the Malaysian Indian Transformation Unit, Mitra. Previously, Mitra came under the Ministry of National Unity, but it has since been moved to the Prime Minister's Department to be placed directly under the Prime Minister. Dr. Sri Isma Sabri said this shows the importance of the development of Indians in Malaysia. Pembentangan budget 2023 bau-bau ini banyak yang telah pun diumumkan oleh kerajaan khusus untuk masyarakat India. Bagi contoh, 100 juta kita sediakan bagi pembangunan usahawan kaum India di bawah unit transformasi masyarakat India ataupun mitra. He said this at a tea session with the Indian community in the Borough Parliamentary Constituency at Dewan Complex Amno Borough Division today. Although there is a specific allocation for the Indian community, Datu Sri Isma Sabri emphasised that the government never sidelined the other communities with various contributions given to everyone eligible as the aim is to ease the financial burden of the people, especially those in the B40 category. The Defence Ministry, through the Malaysian Armed Forces, has made over and above preparations to help the public in the event of floods during the 15th General Election G15. Senior Defence Minister Dr. Sri Hishamuddin Tun Hussein said that the Armed Forces have always been on the front line in helping and securing the safety of the people. Elaborating further, Datu Sri Hishabuddin said his ministry will discuss with the state governments and obtain information on the flood situation or any disaster that occurs in the states. He noted that discussions had been held with Johor Menteri Besar, Datu On Hafiz Ghazi, and he will be meeting Pahang Menteri Besar, Datu Sri Wan Rosdi Wan Ismail soon to discuss the flood mitigation efforts in the state. Kalau semua mainkan peranan um, dan juga bekerjasama rapat, dengan negeri-negeri seperti Menteri Besar sebut tadi penyelarasan, koordinasi dengan antara agensi persekutuan dengan kerajaan negeri saya rasa tidak ada sebab mana-mana pihak akan rasa terjejas sekiranya air naik pun cuma saya dah minta juga um, ATM memikirkan sekiranya Banjir berlaku dalam masa kita berdepan dengan pilihan raya. Apa perkara yang perlu mereka fikirkan over and above. Lebih daripada apa yang mereka selalu prepare, yang mereka selalu buat sebelum ini. He said the ministry's SOP and work template have never been changed. But at the same time, the ministry continues to improve its services and cooperation among agencies. Six houses in Kampung Sentua, Kanga, were affected by a flash flood following a heavy downpour since yesterday. Police Civil Defence Force APM Director Lieutenant Colonel PA Muhammad Izaimi Muhammad Dawood said APM personnel had been instructed to observe the situation and provide aid to victims. Kita kena sudah kena pasti beberapa rumah, terutama di Kampung Sentua kita ada kena pasti ada enam buah rumah. Dan di kampung-kampung lain kita masih lagi mengumpul data sebab uh, kita masih menjejaki rumah-rumah yang 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 terjejas dan kebanyakan rumah dimasuk dimasuki air sehingga para sebuku lali lah. However, he said no temporary relief centres had been opened. Met today, Colonel P A Muhammad Izaimi advised the public to abide by instructions from the authorities to avoid untoward incidents. He said the public is also advised to place their available items on a higher level and to make sure that their children do not play in the rain during this wet season. He added that the APM was working with the Fire and Rescue Department, the Malaysian Volunteer Corps Department (RELA), and the Drainage and Irrigation Department to ensure the safety of the people. Elsewhere, scores of houses in several areas in Pulau Pinang were hit by flash floods following heavy rains from 10pm yesterday. 
State Environment and Welfare Committee Chairman P. Bunpo said he received information that several houses in Batu Maung, Bayan Lepas and Georgetown were flooded, but there was no need for evacuation. However, when contacted today, he said, as of 10 a.m. today, the floodwaters in most of the areas have receded, with all the pump houses in the affected areas operating smoothly. P said the state government is also monitoring the weather over Pulau Pinang, especially locations that are prone to flash floods. Coming up next, encouraging response for the Rantau Nomad Pass since 1st October. Stay with us. Over 2,000 online applications for the D-Rantau Nomad Pass had been recorded since it was opened last 1st October under the Belize Digital Catalytic Programme, Pemangkin. Communications and Multimedia Minister Tan Sri Anwar Musa said it showed a very encouraging response from digital nomads to come, live and work in the country. The Rantau's first location was in Pulau Pirang, which was launched last 13th, September. The program aims at establishing Malaysia as the preferred digital nomad hub to boost digital adoption and promote digital professional mobility and tourism across Malaysia. Through the Rantau, Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation, MDEC, will create a vibrant ecosystem that can support the digital nomad lifestyle to be able to regain the balance in working and living in the country. Tan Sri Arwa said the special pass is valid for 12 months and could be renewed by the digital nomads if they want to reside in the country. Sumbangan digital ekonomi pada sektor sedang meningkat dan kementerian berazam untuk meningkatkan lebih tinggi lagi di mana MDEC mensasarkan 70 bilion. 70 bilion sekarang kita dah capai lebih dari 40 bilion. 45 bilion. Mana benda tu satu benda yang doable malah saya jangka kita boleh melepasi sasaran. He said the ministry had received a request for the program to be held in Sabah. Senior Education Minister Dato Dr. Radzi Jidin is ready to meet a primary school teacher who claims to have received a disciplinary letter following his actions in voicing the problems of the learning syllabus, the issue of heavy bags as well as a large number of students in classes. Dato Dr. Radzi, via post on his Facebook account, said that, he, that the meeting would enable him to know more about the issues raised. He said that he is interested to know more about the matter raised by Cikgu Muhammad Fadli Saleh and if permitted, would like to meet the teacher. Muhammad Fadli, who is a mathematics teacher at a primary school in Gomba, on his Facebook post claimed that he would be sacked or demoted for voicing his views on the learning syllabus which he believes is way too advanced and unsuitable for the age group. He also spoke about the number of students in the class, which according to him were too many, besides too many subjects to learn, and the issue of heavy bags among pupils, which he said could be harmful to the students' health. However, in his latest post, Muhammad Fadli said he will meet Dato Dr. Radzi at some point. Now, all 41 hikers and three mountain guides who were trapped at the Telaga Tuja waterfall in Langkawi following a water surge incident this morning have been rescued. Kedah Fire and Rescue Department Director, Senior Assistant Fire Commissioner Sayani Saidon said that all the victims aged between 30 and 50 were brought to safety from the waterfall area by officers and members of the Langkawi Fire and Rescue Station. In a statement today, she said all 41 hikers and three guides were said to have made the ascent to Telaga Tujo at 4 a.m. and arrived at the summit at 7.30 a.m. They rested for half an hour and started the journey down after heavy rain. When they reached the river, they could not cross due to the strong current and called the fire department. All of the victims did not suffer any injuries and the operation was completed at 3.56 p.m. Police arrested a local man suspected of being involved in the murder of a woman who was found decomposed at the traffic light junction in Jalan Tambun Ipo on 10 October. Perak Police Chief Datuk Muhammad Yusri Hassan Basri said the 24-year-old man, who is also the victim's boyfriend, was detained along with several case items in a house at Taman Bersatu, Simpang Pulai, last Thursday. 
The case was reclassified as murder and is being investigated under Section 302 of the Penal Code after the postmortem report revealed that the cause of death was strangulation. In a statement today, Dr. Obama Yusri said police believe that with the man's arrest, the case has been solved. He said upon completion of the investigation, the case would be referred to the Para Deputy Public Prosecutor's Office for the proposed charge. The media previously reported that police discovered the woman's body in a bush after receiving a call at 5.25 a.m. on a vehicle that crashed near a drain. When police arrived at the scene, they found the decomposed body in the bush about two meters from where the Proton Iswara aerobag car, which was driven by a man, had crashed. segment at least for killed in fire at Tehran prison. Stay with us. But first, Chinese President Xi Jinping called for accelerating the building of a world-class military while touting the fight against COVID-19 as he kicked off a Communist Party Congress by focusing heavily on security and reiterating policy priorities. Xi is widely expected to win a third leadership term at the conclusion of the week-long Congress that began this morning, cementing his place as China's most powerful ruler since Mao Zedong. Roughly 2,300 delegates from around the country gathered in the vast Great Hall of the people of the west side of Tiananmen Square amid tight security and under blue skies after several smoggy days in the Chinese capital. Xi described the five years since the last party congress as extremely uncommon and abnormal during a speech that lasted less than two hours, far shorter than his nearly three-and-a-half-hour address at the 2017 congress. Xi called for strengthening the ability to maintain national security, ensuring food and energy supplies, securing supply chains, improving the ability to deal with disasters, and protecting personal information. He said little about COVID other than to reiterate the validity of a policy that has made China a global outlier as much of the world tries to coexist with the coronavirus. At least four prisoners died in a fire that raged overnight in the Iranian capital's notorious Evin prison as the country has been rocked by a month-long protest movement sparked by the death of Masa Amini. The Judiciary Authority's website, Mizan Online, reported that at least four prisoners died due to smoke inhalation caused by the fire and 61 were injured. Rights groups had voiced grave fears for the inmates of the gunshots and explosions were heard during the blaze from inside the complex, illuminated by flames and smothered by smoke in video footage posted on social media channels. The fire, blamed on riots and clashes, and later brought under control, according to authorities, came as Iran has been rocked by protests over the death of 22-year-old Amini after her arrest for violating Iran's dress code for women. The demonstrations have turned into a major anti-government movement in a country confronting its clerical leadership with one of its biggest challenges since the ousting of the Shah in 1979. Apart from political prisoners, Evin also holds foreign detainees and thousands facing criminal charges. Hundreds of those arrested during the recent demonstrations have reportedly been sent there. At least two people were killed after torrential rain brought major flooding to the Greek island of Crete. Rain started to fall yesterday morning in the southern Greek island, a popular holiday destination, hitting the Heracleon region particularly hard. Greek firefighters said the body of a 49-year-old woman was found in the sea today, raising the death toll to two from the floods. Yesterday, a man in his 50s was found dead after he was trapped in his car as torrential rains began. Local media reported that the rains forced the evacuation of several homes and unleashed extensive damage in seaside villages, where streets became rivers carrying away everything in their path. The flash floods pushed several cars into the sea along the beach of the seaside resort of Aia Pelagia, with some almost completely submerged in the water surrounded by debris. The beach was covered in scrap, including plastic bottles and toys, next to straw umbrellas. The flooding also damaged more than 15 shops, mainly five restaurants in Aia Pelagia, popular with wealthy diners. The Civil Defense Department said it was mobilized and asked all citizens to be vigilant today 
in Crete and the surrounding islands of Rhodes, Carpatos, Castellorizo, and Casos. And in sports, Blickras sprints to stage six victory at Latou de Langkawi. Stay with us. But first, all motorsports activities at the Trangadu Motor Circuit in Gongbara have been suspended effective yesterday. State Youth, Sports and Non-Government Development Committee Chairman Wan Sukairi Wan Abdullah said the directive came following an accident that claimed the life of drag racer Muhammad Hafiz Jamal Jamaluddin during the Battle of the Kings 2022 race yesterday. Explaining further, one Sukairi said all events at the venue were stopped immediately and would resume after the incident report was submitted and the safety aspects of the circuit were looked into. He said studies would be conducted to identify the areas to be improved in terms of safety, facilities, as well as the role of organizers. Yeah, itu itu yang kita masukkan termasuklah termasuk aspek uh, keadaan yang ada pada litar itu sendiri sama ada keperluan untuk kita menambahkan hadang-hadang, hadangan-hadangan di kiri kanan uh, tayar ke apa ke apa-apa sajalah yang kita uh, apa namanya yang kita lihat perlu diadakan maka kita akan lakukan perubahan. Wan Sukairi also said the state government has expressed deep regret over the unfortunate incident and offered his condolences to the victim's bereaved family. Uno X Pro Cycling team rider Arlen Blikra won stage 6 of the Latou de Langkawi LTDL 2022, a distance of 120.4 kilometers from Georgetown to Alo Star today. The Norwegian made history for himself with his first win in his professional racing career after crossing the finish line in a time of 2 hours, 49 minutes, 42 seconds. Astana Kazakhstan's team Gleb Siritsa came in second, while Vodiga Selig from the Lotus Sudal team finished in third place. The race commissioner gave the same time of 2 hours, 49 minutes, 42 seconds to the top 10 riders because they finished the race in a bunch. Blikra's best finish in LTDL this time before this was in the first stage from Kuala Pila to Kuala Lumpur, where he came in second. The yellow jersey for overall leader remained with Ivan Ramiro Sosa Cuervo, representing the movie star team. The green jersey for Spring King changed hands to the LTDL's sixth stage winner, Blikra, while the red jersey for King of Mountain was donned by Trunganu Polygon cycling team's Mohamed Nur Ayman Muhammad Zare. Tomorrow's seventh stage involves the route from Kwa to Gunung Raya in Langkawi, a distance of 90.8 kilometers, the shortest in the eighth stage, LTDL 2022. Johor Darul Tazim JDT lifted the 2022 Super League trophy last night to register their ninth consecutive title and receive the trophy during a glittering ceremony in front of 35,000 cheering fans at the Sultan Ibrahim Stadium in Johor. The highlight of the night came when JDT skipper Mohamed Farizal Marlias and JDT head coach Hector Bidolio lifted the trophy to a thunderous applause from the adoring fans. En route to the title, JDT, who are also known as the Southern Tigers, produced a dominant performance throughout the league season to accumulate 56 points as well as maintain an unbeaten record when the 22-match league was completed. Last night, they also earned a 3-0 victory over Sabah, who started the day in second place, a point ahead of Trungano. The Rhinos needed a win against JDT to keep their hopes of qualifying for the AFC Cup alive, but the Southern Tigers simply swept them aside with goals from Bergson da Silva in the 17th and 55th minutes and Arif Ayman Hanapi in the 39th minutes. Sabah ended third overall, but their hopes of qualifying for the AFC Cup depend on JDT. Should the Southern Tigers achieve a treble by winning the Malaysia Cup, the second AFC Cup berth will go to the league's third place team, that is Sabah. Meanwhile, Trangano FC TFC confirmed the runner-up spot in the Super League to clinch a slot in the 2023 AFC Cup after beating Kedah Darul Aman FC 3-1 at the Darul Aman Stadium in Alo Star last night. Prolific striker Faisal Abdul Halim struck as early as the fourth minute before import striker Chiche Kipre added the second in the 15th minute and third in the 73rd minute. Kadah consolation goal came in the 88th minute through Deji Marcel and the win gave TFC 44 points. 
Masih kembali kepada Dasi Masa keluar untuk Dasi Masa. Over in Pahang, Negeri Sembilan FC, who had an opportunity to finish third, lost 2-0 to Sri Pahang FC at the Darul Makbo Stadium in Kuantan and finished in fourth spot with 41 points. David William Rowley cheered up the elephants when he scored the first goal in the 27 minutes by hitting in the ball from Manuel Federico Hidalgo's pass before adding his second in the 47 minutes. Elsewhere, Selangor FC finished in fifth place after managing only a one-all draw against bottom of the league team, Penang FC. The action at the City Stadium in Georgetown saw striker Mohamed Noor Hakim Hassan emerge as the saviour of the Red Giants team when his goal in the 36th minute erased the advantage of Penang, who opened scoring through a penalty kick by skipper Rafael De Freites in the 30th minute. In Slango, striker Darren Locke emerged as the hero of the Pataling Jaya City FC team and his goal in the 40th minute helped his team with a narrow win over the 2022 AFC Cup finalists Kuala Lumpur City FC at the Pataling Jaya City Council Stadium. The defeat suffered by KL City, who are guided by experienced coach from Croatia, Boyan Hodak, saw them record 29 points to end in 6th position in the league, while PJ City FC were in 9th place with 26 points. Separuh masa kedua mereka ditekan bertubi-tubi. Akram Mahinan, Jordan, bijak. Akram Mahinan untuk pasukan KL City satu tolak. And in tennis, Canadian Felix Auger Aliassi embraced past Italian Lorenzo Mozzetti to advance to the Florence Open final where he will face off against JJ Wolf. Top seeded Auger Aliassi easily defeated third seeded Mozzetti 6 2 6 3 to give himself a shot at his second ATP Tour win of the year. In the early stages of the semi-final, Auger Aliassim displayed strong firepower to hit through Musetti, racing off to an early lead. The Canadian remained flawless from the baseline, firing 21 winners to only 6 on force errors, dispatching the Italian in 1 hour, 27 minutes. When Musetti was trailing 2-5 in the opening set, he called for the physio to address discomfort in his abdominal region. But Auger Aliassim never let the Italian back into the match as he advanced to his third final of the season, all of which have come on indoor hard courts, including in Rotterdam and Marseille. The Canadian, who has already climbed two places this week to number 11 in the Pepperstone ATP rankings, will reclaim a coveted spot in the top 10 if he beats first-time finalist JJ Wolf tonight. A win for the 22-year-old would also improve his chances at making the season-ending ATP Tour Finals. Winding up the news at 10, in our top story, Datu Sri Isma Sabri remains as Prime Minister candidate. Join us again at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon. Till then, it's Lights Out. I'm Brendan LaPaul. Salam Kroger Blisya and have a wonderful week ahead. Take care.